of Arthur D. Little, uh, who besides uh, having designed many of the projects which were located as scientific experiments on the moon in the Apollo days, is also the inventor of the satellite solar power concept. And we panelists then will be in discussion, and I, I hope in open discussion with the group. How would you like to commence, gentlemen? Shall we invite questions? Or would you like to start with your own comments? Peter, do you well, have some comments uh, to make? I'm, first of all, delighted that uh, we have this opportunity to get together. Uh, Professor O'Neill and I have uh, had uh, similar objectives for over a decade, and I'm delighted uh, that the ISU has seen fit to invite all of us and to have the important uh, exercises that you've been working on so diligently uh, during the past week. Bill? <clears throat> well, I think uh, this is an exceptional event uh, to bring before the uh, International Space University the uh, concept of the solar power satellite and, and some of the technologies that go along with it. Uh, of course, the one I'm concerned with is uh, getting the power from the solar power satellite uh, down to Earth, and that's a distance, as you know, of uh, 32,000, let's see, about 23,000 miles or about 36,000 kilometers. And uh, <clears throat> this is a task that was uh, uh, studied uh, under a Department of Energy uh, NASA contract uh, uh, some years ago, and uh, it was decided that it was a practical sort of thing to do. That after picking up the uh, uh, solar power, converting it into ordinary DC electrical power, could be converted into microwave energy, and then it beamed down to Earth and picked up with an overall efficiency, DC to DC efficiency of about, uh, of about 50 percent. And this has been studied. Uh, to a large extent through many uh, NASA contracts as well as the Department of Energy contract and it seems to be a feasible sort of thing to do. But one of the things that we should discuss here I think and, and uh, uh, perhaps you could uh, sort of discuss this broadly is the <coughs> business of transportation in space because the, uh, the present uh, uh, transportation uh, system that we're using uh, may, in space at least, may may not quite cut the uh, mustard, so to speak. Um, Dr. Nagatomo, you like to comment? Yes. <coughs> when I was a student like you, I, we have an uh, international geophysical year. Uh, at that time, I studied my career as a rocket engineer and involved in uh, various space project. Uh, that is uh, mainly the, uh, requiring the technological uh, development. And uh, almost a quarter century passed since that, and uh, uh, I'm very uh, pleased to be here and to see your students of the International Space University. And, uh, I envy you because that uh, uh, you can uh, you can learn everything in two months. Uh, what okay. I have gained uh, learned uh, for a quarter century, and uh, recently I have a very small meeting. Uh, that is a kind of symposium. Uh, the title is uh, "What is a Moon." What is a moon symposium? I ask the several person. Uh, I ask the every participant, uh, a questionnaire. What is a moon to you? And uh, one third of the uh, answer is that is a new world. Uh, it's a new continent. And one third is concerned with the, that is my uh, spiritual. Uh, uh, old uh, origin, and so that uh, most of the people think that the uh, moon is already a uh, part of the earth, and uh, so when I studied the 
my own career, it was technology. Space is uh, mainly uh, means technology development. But the reason is that people understand that uh, that is a place uh, where to go, for us to go. That's a very important progress of our mind. Thank you. Question here. Yes, um, Dr. O'Neill, in, in the um, Space Studies Institute film, the, an analogy was made between the lunar processing system and uh, a seed, a tree, and a forest. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit of your views as to how you, what proportion of the system will self-duplicate in this manner. Um, let me just repeat the question in case no, uh, not everyone heard it. it. It was the comment on the film which showed the analogy of a uh, partially self-replicating system to a, uh, a seed growing into a tree and then shedding further seeds and so on. Uh, the, the question uh, was of detail about how that, that can happen and the degree to which it can happen. I think the, it's really an economic issue more than any other. And the, the key point is that if you look at the components of mass drivers, of uh, job shops, and of chemical processing plants, what you find in every case is that the dominant portion, the dominant weight of those uh, installations uh, are relatively simple uh, and rather uh, uh, repetitive particularly true in the case of the mass driver where you have a very large number of repetitive, essentially identical coils. Uh, but it also turns out to be true in detail when you look at the other components. If you look at something like a, uh, an industrial robot, to take another example, an industrial robot, as far as weight is concerned, consists mostly of relatively simple framework, uh, hardware supporting structure it then has a rather small amount by weight of highly complex equipment on it and a brain of some kind, an electronic brain, which is controlling it, and that is very light in weight. So the, the key point, I think, about self-replication is that you want, to, you want to go as far in self-replication as makes sense economically, and that is definitely not 100%. You always bring the computers, the microprocessors, and so on from the Earth, you probably bring all of the very small, lightweight, labor-intensive, complex pieces from the Earth. But the remainder, the dumb, heavy, simple portions of this equipment, is about 99% by weight. Now, the, the other numbers which are important to, to carry with you are that it happens to be true, after one analyzes these things, that a mass driver can launch approximately 100 times its own weight of material every year, launch from the moon to a precise point in, in space. Uh, a chemical process plant, if you analyze that, turns out also to process roughly 100 times its own weight of material in the course of a year. And a job shop, uh, very similarly. In fact, if you go to the lengths of analyzing an automobile factory in uh, any one of the major industrial countries, you find that the weight of automobiles turned out per year is approximately 100 times the weight of the machinery that produces them. So you have a very high leverage with that factor of 100. And please carry with you then the, the appreciation that you have that leverage of a factor of 100 and that you're looking for replication that may be to the 98 or 99 percent level, not more than that. But I think that in at least considerable part, it may help to answer the question that Dr. Brown brought up of the limitations of our transportation systems. Because if you have that high leverage working in your favor, you can get along with relatively primitive transportation systems for the Earth to orbit leg. Question over here. Um, it's a question for both Dr. Glaser and Dr. O'Neill. In the uh, video SSI videotape, the idea was put forward of using a solar power satellite uh, over such an area as Africa to help develop um, uh, developing nations. Um, how do you see um, the role of a solar power satellite in, alongside developing appropriate technology for developing nations? Uh, I believe this is not a question of either or. I'm convinced we have to do both. 
we can certainly use appropriate technology on the ground, but there will come a point in developing nations where they no longer will be called developing nations. When they cross over the, the threshold to become an industrialized nation, then they will need power. And it's at that stage to get them, to help them uh, cross this threshold, that they will need continuous supply of power. I believe when that will happen sometimes in 20 years or so, then we will have to have means to provide power in the quantities they need. The quantities may not be huge quantities, and what we will have to design are solar power satellites which are adaptable to supply just the right amount. Now that can be done either with one solar power satellite and multiple beams, or small satellites. And here we can either use microwave beams or eventually laser beams. I think I'd only like to add to that a, a comment that uh, uh, solar power satellites seen as a source of, of energy, again in what you might call the appropriate quantities, as Dr. Glazer has mentioned, should also be contrasted with some of the difficulties that we have in trying to obtain energy and solve some of our large-scale problems on the Earth by alternative methods. Uh, for a long time, I think many of us felt that hydroelectric dams were a rather benign kind of uh, source of electric energy. But as I'm sure all of you have read, it's now been found that in the attempts to build hydroelectric dams at great cost in many of the developing nations, uh, those dams, besides destroying large amounts of, of land area, have turned out to have an astonishingly short lifetime. Many of them silt up and become useless in as little as 15 to 20 years. And that's a problem which is now uh, very serious with the Aswan High Dam in Egypt. It's a very serious problem in some of the uh, dams that have been built in South America, and they're beginning to be questions about such dams in Asia as well. So uh, one has to look at all of these things, not just from the short-term point of view, but from the long-term view as well. Yes, sir. I'm directing these questions to Dr. Glazer and Dr. Brown. What levels of microwave power are required for solar power satellites, and how do these levels compare with present, present exposure levels and limits for lifetime exposure? The assumption that we have made in uh, coming up with a concept for solar power satellite is that it has to be environmentally benign, and that it means that uh, we have to have the microwave beams at such a level that there are no interactions with the ecology, no adverse reaction. Uh, the type of approach that we have used is to have at its maximum a beam which in terms of its flux density is one quarter that of sunlight at high noon. At the edges of the site where the microwaves are converted directly into electricity, we are down at levels which are at least one-tenth below the level accepted for leakage out of microwave ovens with the door closed. You know, it's an interesting <clears throat> thing that people have, of course, been concerned about uh, microwave microwave uh, effects on biology for a long time, but just before turning over to uh, Dr. Brown for the other part of this answer, uh, I'd just like to point out that as a physicist, I'm concerned about the issue of the direct biological effects of any form of uh, energy when it's transmitted. And a thing which is normally missed by most people is that the key thing that causes uh, cell damage, it causes changes to the molecular structure of living molecules, is whether uh, the energy which comes in is in a quantum of energy that can break a molecular bond. Now, the ultraviolet light that you get when you go out and lie on a beach uh, in the sun in a bathing suit uh, is quite strong enough to break those molecular bonds. It has quantum energies that do that, that's why you get sunburn. But the quantum energies that are associated with the microwave transmission of power from space are about one forty thousandth as large as the quanta which are big enough to break molecular bonds. Well, I'd just like to uh, extend that by saying that <clears throat> as far as I know, uh, 
no one has ever uh, suffered serious illness uh, from being uh, exposed to uh, uh, <clears throat> microwave radiation. There have been some some situations uh, where people received uh, uh, fairly heavy doses of microwave radiation uh, from radars, uh, <clears throat> high-powered radars, in which there may be some question. But uh, for the ordinary civilian population uh, subjected to the microwave oven or to microwave uh, transmissions, uh, communication transmissions, uh, uh, these uh, power levels are so low that uh, they, they are really, really minuscule. Um, in this connection, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, Although this is a common subject of conversation uh, about uh, radiation from uh, microwaves, and as you pointed out, uh, the, uh, these levels are, are very low compared with uh, ultraviolet, that uh, uh, if everybody in the United States uh, or in the world, shall, shall we say, turned on their microwave ovens, uh, you would gener be generating about uh, 30 gigawatts, 30 million kilowatts of microwave power all at the same time. And uh, uh, so we've learned to live with that uh, that type of microwave uh, microwave power. Yeah. Dr. O'Neill, anyone else? Um, what do you think are the primary uh, hurdles, both technological and otherwise, that will have to be navigated in order to fulfill the dreams that were in the video? I think that all of us need to be involved in that answer. Uh, it seems to me. I, I, I best answer, my answer at least, is to is to give some principles of how I think we should we should go forward. I think the that one of them is that we should uh, try to separate our total task into a number of subtasks, each one of which is manageable in its own right, each one of which can be attacked on its own right. If you look at trying to solve very large technological problems uh, through solutions in which you have to solve everything at the same time or else you don't solve anything, then I think you can be in a perpetual morass. You never get off the ground. And every successful solution to a large technological problem that I have seen has involved breaking that problem down into ind individual components and solving them one at a time. So I, I believe that that principle is quite important. The other thing that goes with it is that I think that you must have individual tasks which can reach individual success in rather short periods of time. And I, I would put the extreme time horizon there as four to five years. If there's something which is a marvelous idea but it will take 20 years to do, then it's going to be very difficult to make it happen. But if you can break it into four individual tasks where you can see milestones of success and genuine accomplishment, not just publicity and accomplishment, but real accomplishment. Uh, every five years, then I think you've got a good shot at doing it. And the last thing is I think you've got to look everywhere at doing things in the most economical way possible. And I don't care whether that whether you're dealing with something which is a massive international program or with something done by an individual nation or even done privately uh, where that's possible. Uh, everywhere and in every culture and in every government, you always run into a cash crunch at some point. And so doing things in the most economical way is, is critically important. Does that answer your question, at least from my point of view? I'd invite other people to comment. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, I think uh, there's a way of going about it, uh, which will teach us as we go along. And that is absolutely essential, because we don't have all the answers today. We are fairly confident about the technologies involved. These are challenges to engineers, and our major task is how can we get the best performance at the lowest cost. But in addition, we have to show that there are uh, material benefits, so if you like, uh, economics enters the equation. We have to understand the return on investment. We have to understand the capital investments required. And we have to understand the societal issues, particularly environmental impacts. If we have large areas where we have to have receiving antennas, we have to understand what that does in the specific site that would be selected, whether on land or in the oceans. We also have to be concerned that none of the nations of this world individually own anything in space. They do not control orbit position, 
for example, in geostationary orbit, they don't control frequency assignment, and they're not on the moon. Therefore, we cannot expect unilaterally, as one nation, to go out and do these things. And I believe that we will have to find ways to work much more closely together, because we are somewhat like a person who is facing a death sentence. It does focus the mind on the <laughs> solutions, remarkably. And in a sense, if we in this world cannot figure out how to overcome some of the major threats that our civilization faces, particularly carbon dioxide, greenhouse effects, pollution, etc., we really are sealing our fate in terms of future progress. The question, by the way, in case not everyone heard it, was how, in a practical way, do we go about realizing these visions that have been described in, in the film and, and in our conversations? Uh, other people want to comment? Well, I just make one comment in one technology area, and that is microwave power transmission, beaming power by microwaves. And, uh, and again, this is on an international basis. The Canadians have been doing some very interesting work recently on using a microwave beam to power a free-flying airplane. And these uh, experiments, uh, although they only go up to an altitude of a quarter of a mile, have been very successful in demonstrating some of the, some of the uh, principles of the receiving element on the microwave power transmission system, the antenna, and for that matter, the, uh, the whole system. And, uh, of course, this is on a small scale, and the next thing to do is to get this airplane up to an altitude of uh, uh, 20 kilometers where it can perform some very useful communication and uh, uh, surveillance functions. And I think the Canadians are on their way, and that is the part of the learning curve and the stepping stones with respect to one of the sub-technologies connected with the solar power, the satellite. I might also add, if I may, that one true international aspect of beaming power up uh, to an orbiting transfer vehicle, for example, uh, reversing the solar power satellite and, and uh, using the beam from the Earth uh, up to uh, uh, help the uh, low Earth orbit to uh, geosynchronous orbit uh, transportation problem. In doing that, all these transmitters have to be located on the equator. So this is truly an international situation. It's not a political situation. Mother Nature says if you're going to do this, you've got to locate the transmitters there. And so, uh, we, we do have this aspect of international collaboration that, uh, that may be a factor involved. Dr. Nagatomo? Yes, I have... Uh, I feel often the difficulty to start some project. If the project size of the project is uh, larger, then the difficulty is uh, larger. I think uh, it is because that, uh, it takes a longer time for people to understand the meaning the objective individual project and so that uh, in, s in the case of the solar power satellite and the moon development uh, it takes uh, uh, in the worst case it takes a century it's too late to start after we reached the consensus and in that sense uh, I am a little bit different from the Dr. O'Neill's opinion that uh, we should uh, promote small projects, technological projects uh, that are related to the uh, common final uh, goal. And then somebody uh, should take, pay attention to the individual project and try to coordinate them. And then the the people will uh, feel that uh, uh, realistic results and uh, also the materialistic uh, result, as uh, Dr. Jim said. And then we can make a greater step after that, and so that uh, we should be uh, patient in that sense. I'd like to add to this uh, very uh, correct observation is that we are actually starting to do that. The first step that uh, we are planning to take and recommendation has been made that we hold an international space power test as part of the international space year which will start in the year 1992. 
that is very valuable. It will give us a lot of data. It involves many different nations. The second step that we wish to take is to say that we need more power in space for use in space. Uh, we need it for space stations, for free-flying platforms. Uh, for example, the Mir space station is underpowered. They don't have enough power, and therefore we can see that uh, we might have uh, a power plant in space. Uh, might be equivalent to a utility in uh, this country. The Orbital Power and Light Company, if you want to be somewhat facetious. And once we have that experience and do that on a larger scale, it'll be a lot easier to show that now that we've learned these things, we can be power back to Earth. I think I'd just like to add one other example of relatively small-scale things which are on the way to solving the total problem. Uh, one of the most exciting, rather small-scale, high-payoff projects that one can imagine is a lunar polar orbiter, which can go into orbit over the surface of the moon, a remote unmanned space probe, and survey the surface of the moon using the natural emissions from the surface materials as a result of cosmic ray and solar bombardment uh, to find out what's there. Because uh, there is a strong possibility that there's even water on the moon in the uh, permanently frozen shadowed regions of the North Zenda space probe out there to find out. But it's a very small scale mission. It's something that can be done at a tiny, tiny fraction of the cost of any nation's space program. Good example, I think, of something that ought to be done very soon. Very low cost, quick return, high payback. Question back there, sir. Uh, there has been adequate emphasis on developing space technology, but there seems to be very little balance with the development of space culture. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Neil, uh, would be the reason for a future when we uh, don't have adequate preparation for a space culture, but we have adequate space technology? Uh, the question was, uh, what happens if we uh, if we develop the space technology but don't have uh, but haven't prepared uh, culture for space? Uh, and I think that part of the answer is with us today in the sense that there are people within ISU who have strong interest uh, not just in the life sciences but in the social sciences as well and they're already very interested in working on these things. But also I have a, a, a personal feeling, and here I invite comments from others, I have a personal feeling about the human race which is first of all that uh, it has astonishing powers of survival and resilience even under unusual conditions. If you look at some of the places where human cultures have survived and uh, grown well over uh, many hundreds of years on the surface of the earth, they are far harsher environments than one finds uh, out in space. Uh, so the human, the human uh, culture is, is quite resilient. The other thing is that human beings have a, uh, a strong tendency not to want to be told how to behave. And I think that it's rather important that as we develop the options for people moving into space and living there, that we not prescribe for them how they are to live. Because I think once they're there and living, they're going to tell us how they want to live rather than the other way around. Over there. Uh, this question is to Dr. Blazer. You pointed out this morning uh, four uh, ideal locations for the um, solar satellite uh, Earth stations, and all of them were around the equator. Uh, how does that compare, or how does that compete with other um, larger uh, locations, maybe like the desert? In particular, I'm asking about, for example, the desert of Saudi Arabia. How would that compare with other locations on the equator? Uh, the question uh, is, uh, what is uh, a reason for locations, uh, perhaps in deserts uh, and equator, and how can those be chosen? Uh, the equatorial location is probably a very desirable one. Uh, it is not an easy one because a lot of oceans uh, that we would have to cross. And for that reason, uh, we have done quite a bit of work on having receiving antennas actually as floating platforms in the ocean. It so happens that most of the major cities around the world are either on the shore of oceans or very near them. 
Uh, we also have surveyed in the United States possible locations, and there are quite a few of those available. And then there are special situations. For example, uh, in Holland, a study was made whether the uh, polder dams, which uh, they have developed there to take the land back from the ocean, uh, could not be used for having these receiving antennas. So I think that each uh, location, each site, would have to be studied in its own merit, and uh, the various construction methods used uh, to make it environmentally the most interesting one, as well as economically affordable. Uh, using laser, uh, how powerful is um, from my understanding, there's no problem between satellites and satellites or satellites and stations. <coughs> but when, when the laser goes through atmosphere, there's problems. Now, the problem is, first of all, it's dis dispersion, it expands, and also go through the atmosphere. Does it change the composition of the atmosphere? I think how are we can handle these difficulties? Well, Aiming, uh, composition. The question is, uh, how will we handle laser power transmission in space and back to Earth and what's happening to the atmosphere? Uh, laser power transmission is uh, fairly well advanced. Uh, we, have, we are learning a great deal at the generating end. We really don't know how to convert lasers directly into electricity with high efficiency. Microwaves, we now know we can convert with efficiencies of about 85% microwaves to electricity. Lasers uh, are more in the 40 to 50%. In space, it's somewhat, as you correctly point out, easier to use lasers. Uh, we have learned how to get lasers through the atmosphere, particularly if we use the right spectral region, for example, in certain IR regions. Uh, there is interference and there is some loss. And therefore, we may want to have receiving sites on the tops of high mountains rather than near sea level. So we still have a lot to learn with lasers. And for that reason, I believe, we may want to first try out using microwaves and later on lasers. I'm sure we eventually will learn how to do that. But at the moment, it isn't quite competitive. Could I uh, add a bit to that? Uh uh, it, it's only in the lower uh, frequency region of microwaves, say uh, a frequency of around uh, 2 to 3 gigahertz, uh, corresponding to a wavelength of, say, uh, around uh, 10 to 15 uh, centimeters, that uh, you can get reliable transmission through the Earth's atmosphere at all times. Even during heavy rainstorms, uh, you will not have, you will have negligible attenuation of the microwaves. As you go up in frequency, even microwave frequency, you begin to have a, a lots of, of problems. It's really an aperture problem. If you're going to be at low frequency and want to have high power transmission over, uh, want to have efficient uh, transmission over long distance, you need to have a large transmitting aperture and a large receiving aperture. As you go up to laser frequencies, of course, that can be a, a great deal smaller. But you do have these problems. If you're going to generate power in space and your efficiency isn't 100%, you have to get rid of any of this waste heat. And it turns out, uh, from at least my experience in looking at the solar power satellite system, that the biggest problems there is getting rid of the waste uh, waste heat that you generate in the uh, inefficient conversion processes there. And uh, so you may want large areas uh, to handle this, very large areas. And I think the laser has a problem there because it, it generates it in a small volume and any inefficiency is a real problem in dissipating that energy in space. Let me ask sort of for a, an, an honor system and ask that people who have not asked questions before be given priority in, in asking questions now. So back there, please. Yeah. Yes, um, question for, for you, Dr. Um, in the late 60s, early 70s, the Department of Energy, as I understand it, helped to fund a solar power satellite program, which was very interesting, very successful. But unfortunately, that program was shelled later on in the 70s. It's now 1988, and a lot of work has been performed. Is the Department of Energy and the U.S. administration and other governments around the world aware of the progress which has been made in that time? 
and uh, are they aware of the promise of solar power satellites in general? It is uh, to my regret. No, the question is, uh, is uh, U.S. Department of Energy, which together with NASA have uh, had a very significant study of solar power satellites, sort of re-examining uh, this whole subject today. To my regret, uh, the answer as of now is no. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has uh, an office which, uh, in theory, is uh, supposed to look at it in the Energy Research Division, but there are no funds for looking at uh, solar power satellites. And uh, the reason is probably political to some extent, uh, partly because uh, uh, the thrust in the Department of Energy is away from renewable resources. Solar energy, which had a major support, uh, close to a billion dollars uh, in the mid 70s is now, I'm not sure, perhaps less than a hundred million dollars. Uh, solar power satellites uh, were considered sort of a far out uh, kind of a thing. And uh, we essentially abandoned it. And then there was a National Academy report which said, well, it looks like the transportation costs and solar cell costs are very high, uh, therefore let's wait and let's re-examine it uh, in, in, in a decade. Uh, what has happened is that, uh, as we in the United States uh, said, well, we're going to wait, uh, the subject became of great interest, uh, for example, in the Soviet Union, in Europe, and in Japan. Uh, if I am correct, uh, the Soviet Union's interest in that goes back at least a decade, uh, the designer uh, of the Soyuz capsule, Dr. Fyok Tistov, publicly said that uh, this is one of the reasons why they're building a space station. Uh, in a recent book on technology in the US, USSR space program, Andujevsky, I think that was the author, said that the most important research program uh, to them may well be the solar power satellite. Uh, an article which appeared in the August issue of last year in the London Times actually dealt with that subject in three different full-page articles on successive days and showed that the Soviet Union has plans to do some of these things. They've uh, discussed it at the International Astronautical Federation Congress, which was held in Sweden in 1985 indicating that by between now and 2010, they expect to spend about $150 billion on this project. Uh, I will let uh, Dr. Uh, Nakatomo explain what Japan is doing. Let me just say, in Europe, several countries, including France, have supported programs of uh, looking at uh, solar power satellites. They've held a major conference in Paris in 1986 on this subject. They're doing research, and there are various other European countries interested, and here we are just dead in the water. It's a hard question for me. Uh, in Japan, the space is uh, considered a matter of security, and uh, it's mainly concerned with the sovereignty. Uh, for the United States and the Soviet Union, the superpower. Japan is now interested in just the economical aspect of uh, space development. Uh, in that sense, uh, right now the communication satellite and uh, as a as resource satellite, uh, that is uh, our uh, limit of consensus. Uh, for the space program, but we are uh, we are very uh, positive to participate in the space station program, and uh, in this case, uh, we recognize very well about uh, uh, the shortage of electrical power in space, and so that the first approach might be the uh, to supply the uh, electric 
electrical power in space. And then gradually the technological uh, evolution and also the uh, demand will expand our, our recognition about the space. Uh, it doesn't make sense to explain that, Dr. Grazers. I think I'd just like to add one comment on, on uh, following Dr. Glazer's dead in the water for the United States. Quite true from a, uh, from a governmental point of view, and I think it illustrates one of, the, one of the main reasons why organizations like the Space Studies Institute were founded, which are independent of government funding and support. It's very difficult, I think, to sustain a, uh, uh, a program which is uh, regarded as, as not yet a mainstream program within a federal government over a long period of time. Uh, on the other hand, uh, most of the important things that have been accomplished in the world, if you talk about really new things, have been accomplished by small bands of fanatics who didn't believe, that, uh, didn't believe it when everybody told them that something couldn't be done. Uh, history is full of just those sorts of examples. And I think, therefore, it's very important that there be a there be one or more uh, organizations which, uh, which are formed uh, not by governments, perhaps ultimately with government uh, support, but not by governments and not depending on governments where they're getting off the ground, literally. Uh, I think ISU is a very good example of just that kind. It, was, it uh, now has some governmental funding, but it was not definitely not formed by governments. And uh, even in commercial uh, terms, uh, the Geostar Corporation, which I mentioned briefly, has, has been getting a fair number of awards as, as a kind of unique example of, a, of an organization that uh, is doing something real in space, but not just to satisfy the uh, federal government as a customer, uh, but in fact quite independent of the fact that it's totally privately supported. Uh, by now, it has uh, governmental users uh, who are uh, paying for its service. So I think that governments will come in to new programs at a time when their practicality is demonstrated, but they tend not to be the leaders in bringing those programs in, at least in the United States. Now, uh, I'm very happy about the fact that the Soviet Union is, appears to be committed to a large-scale program of solar power satellites, and I hope that that will eventually develop in Japan and in other places as well. I think it's more important that it happen for the human race than that it happen by a particular country. And I have a feeling that as has happened in the case of launch vehicles, once you see a success in one place, there will be plenty of imitators. The human race doesn't tend to move ahead in an orderly, uh, pre-programmed way. It tends to move ahead by somebody going out and doing something first and then everybody else imitating it. And that may well happen in that case, too. Uh, I might uh, also suggest that uh, there's another organization devoted to power in space and power from space for use on Earth, and that's the SunSat Energy Council. Uh, it is just like the Space Studies Institute, uh, a group which is devoted to this subject. We publish a journal called Space Power and uh, we hold meetings, and we work very closely with the Space Studies Institute. Yeah, good point. Question here? Yeah, technical question. According to my understanding now, so all the solar power satellites will be put into the geostationary orbit. And my question is, uh, you know, the solar energy is infinity, but the orbit position in the geostationary orbit is limited. It may have some impact impact compact on the development of the solar power satellite. Well, let me, let me give a first answer and let Dr. Glazer probably give you a more correct one. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question is, uh, so in effect, suppose we were to become dependent on uh, satellite solar power as the major portion of our energy for the, for the world. Uh, what uh, will that work when you consider the limited available space in the geostationary orbit. Uh, a few years ago, in, in comparing various alternative energy sources for the future in a book that I, I was preparing, uh, I reviewed all of the potential uh, sources of energy that could 
supply the amount of energy required by the predicted size of the human race uh, roughly in the year 2080. Uh, it's a very large amount of energy. It's many times what is used at the present time. And I looked at its being supplied uh, almost exclusively by satellite solar power as one extreme assumption. And my conclusion was that it was that there was plenty of space available in geostationary orbit to do that. And one of the main reasons why that turned out to be true is that when you're in geostationary orbit, uh, you can build structures of very large size uh, without their having to weigh very much because the forces involved are very small. In particular, if you have a solar power satellite which is in geostationary orbit, that's the stable point, you can extend by structure uh, transverse to the geostationary orbit in both directions in a symmetrical fashion quite a long way and develop further area on which you can put solar cells. And you can go on doing that for many kilometers before you uh, build up any significant forces uh, that limit the size of your construction. I also looked at the issue of uh, waste heat given off by those satellites and waste heat given off by the ground station uh, receiving antennas. My conclusion was that it was the most environmentally benign source of energy that one could imagine. Dr. Glazer, you want to Yes, I, I think this geostationary uh, orbit is just one location for <laughs> solar power satellites. We could be in a sun-synchronous orbit as well. In fact, uh, several suggestions along these lines have been made, so I think we shouldn't just say it's one orbit alone. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, that's another way of looking at it. Uh, the civilizations really can fall into three classes. The first class is the one which utilizes all of the energy incident on it from its sun. The second class civilization is the one which uses all of the energy emanating from its sun. And the third is the energy that is available to it from the universe. So we have a long ways to go in terms of utilizing just the energy available from the sun. Over here. Um, what is the attitude of astronomers concerning the solar power satellites? Because uh, I suppose that those solar power satellites are very large structures in the sky for uh, an astronomer to be a physical observer, or do they agree with this kind of project? Uh, the question is, how do astronomers feel about solar power satellites? The answer is very ambivalently. <laughs> the reason is very simple. If solar power satellites are in geostationary orbit, they are large objects, and uh, even if we try and do the best we can, there will be some loss of seeing if you look in the direction of the satellite. Uh, I believe that that problem will be with us uh, for a limited time because we don't have to be on Earth to study astronomy. We can observe from some marvelous place called the backside of the moon uh, we can have uh, astronomical observatories in space. And uh, yes, there will be a group of people on Earth who will be unhappy, and that's the amateur astronomers. And I think here is a question for the civilization to discuss. What is more important? Amateur astronomy, or perhaps we can still have them do that too, or energy from space for use on Earth. Those are, I think, the trade-offs which you will have to be looking at. Question here. Um, so we've heard a lot about mass drivers this afternoon. When one has driven a mass from the moon, one then has to catch it. Um, firstly, could you comment on the possible methods for catching mass? And secondly, is it possible to utilize the kinetic energy of this mass during the catching process? Well, this question about uh, mass drivers, uh, <coughs> because there's a conversation about the acceleration of a mass driver, um, there hadn't been discussion about the, the rest of the trajectory of payloads leaving the moon and how they are collected in space. And the question also was, uh, can one use the kinetic energy of the launch process itself? Uh, there, are, there are several parts of the answer. I'll try to make them brief. The first is that one does indeed use the kinetic energy 
In fact, uh, approximately 99% of the kinetic energy which is put into the payload by a mass driver on the moon is used up in the transformation into potential energy as the payload climbs on its trajectory out from the moon out to uh, what is probably the second Lagrangian point in space. Uh, second, the, uh, the location of the collection point is chosen for a couple of reasons. It's chosen because there is a family of what are called achromatic trajectories that can be used, uh, which are trajectories that start from the mass driver and end up at the same point in space, uh, even though the forward velocities which are used uh, in the individual payloads may differ somewhat. And uh, one can, in fact, get one more of the three coordinates uh, taken care of as well by choosing the launch point and the collection point in the same way. Uh, the, there are also families of such trajectories in the case of, uh, of long-range shell fire and so on. They're well known. Uh, the, the last point is that one needs to do some mid-course correction, and that turns out to be, uh, at least on the basis of the research done so far, quite practical. One has a flying spot scanner using a laser beam which looks at a payload about one minute into the flight when it is still very close to the surface of the moon and about 100 kilometers downrange. If you, uh, if you uh, find the location and time of the payload very accurately with a laser flying uh, spot scanner, you can then use a computer program to tell you how you want to slightly nudge the payload in order that it arrive at the correct point in space. And you do that simply by charging it up electrostatically and then deflecting it as if, as if it were a fat electron in, a, in an old-fashioned cathode ray tube. The calculations indicate that one should be able to hit a target at the L2 point with, where that target is of about dimensions of one meter by five meters after a flight which takes some 60 hours. Another question? Back here. How are we doing on time? <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Nick wasn't to build satellites, large structures that cost a lot of money. Now, the satellite's life is short, isn't it? It's about 12 years or so. Infinitely long. Infinitely long? The life of a satellite will be infinitely long for the simple reason that once we have placed a satellite in orbit, we can maintain it. We can have parts. Uh, come and particularly some electronics components and things of that so we can replace those. The structure that is 90 odd percent of the total mass, there's nothing that will happen to it. Rocks on the moon are billion years old. The space environment is very benign in that sense. I'd like to... Um, what about the radiation from the radiation? Is it this? affect the mirrors and reflectors, and if that's so, wouldn't we say, have we considered building on the moon? And if it's not, why not? Why? Uh, what's wrong? The question is, uh, what about the radiation effects on solar cell and other materials, and can we build uh, solar power satellites on the moon? Uh, we are now looking at solar cells, and research is ongoing, for example, gallium arsenide solar cells, uh, can be annealed in situ and thus have an infinitely long lifetime. Uh, as far as having solar power satellites on the moon, yes, that has been also looked at, and it is possible that this may be one way to do it. It's somewhat a longer distance to transmit the beam back to us. The, the original question was, uh, don't satellites have about a 12-year life, and how can one therefore talk about long-life solar power satellites? And Dr. Glazer has answered it, but just just sort of uh, to complete the answer, I should say that, uh, that the lifetime of commercial communication satellites is set not by the lifetime of the structure, which is, as he said, basically infinite, but because they are put up with a uh, fixed payload of hydrazine propellant for station keeping, and that propellant runs out in about 10 or 12 years. Uh, at the present time, there is no mechanism for resupply, but that's what sets the lifetime of satellites in orbit. And as he says, as soon as you get resupply possible, then you can make them last pretty much forever. I'd, like, <clears throat> I'd just like to say something in 30 seconds uh, on the microwave power transmission system. We, we've looked at that, and really that, uh, that is a system that is uh, highly reliable. Uh, 
We think that the, uh, the generators that convert DC to microwave power, that their lifetime will be of the order of 30 or 40 years before they have to be replaced. And another thing about the solar power satellite system is it's highly redundant. You can rely upon it 99.5% uh, of the time of the year for, for uh, power, as opposed to our present public utility systems where the uh, online factor may be as low as 70%. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, you pointed out a uh, very good point that uh, there, is, uh, there are several invisible uh, difficulties in uh, technology for the large-scale solar power satellite. So one is uh, the repairability, because that, uh, it should be used permanently. It should be equipped with a built-in repairing and maintenance system. So that, uh, that is, should be the part of the system itself. So that uh, <coughs> it can repeatedly uh, repair itself, just like a human body. And uh, uh, additional two points is that, that very high uh, mass production technology will be required. For example, the lectina. Uh, we need uh, one billion pieces of dipole antenna and the diode. And uh, what uh, the, we have no such a technology to build uh, such a thing uh, in a few years. At the, uh, at the present, the Japanese semiconductor uh, manufacturer, the average number of the mass production is uh, about uh, one million pieces of uh, IC or something like that per month. If this is applied for the solar power satellite, it uh, takes us one century for one unit of lectin. But that's a problem. We, we, that's the semiconductor manufacturer is increasing the number one order. Another point is uh, uh, by the speed of the construction, we have to manage the incomplete configuration. I, I'm saying that the transient configuration management, the system is uh, studied from uh, nothing and uh, it has become a very large structure. During this construction, that uh, we have to manage the uh, uh, various parameters, uh, systems which are changing the parameters. And so that uh, in this case, uh, the only the solution is uh, to speed up the production rate. I'm, I'm sorry that we have to close off the discussion at this point just because we're out of time, but I think that as we have a, a very interested panel and a, clearly a very interested group of people in the audience, I'd encourage further discussion after we do have to close off. And I thank all of the panelists very much for their contributions to the afternoon and thank all of the uh, students of ISU very much for the excellent questions that they've, they've raised. Thank you. <laughs>